Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting uh, with George Galloway and the Workers' Party of Britain on what is wrong with the British media. Over to you, George. Thank you very much indeed, and to all the party members on Zoom, fraternal greetings, and to all who have not yet joined us, but I hope will do so by the end of this meeting or soon. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, our regular Tuesday night uh, meeting, public meeting, a virtual public meeting, which is attracting a great deal of interest and, and viewership, uh, not just actually in this country, but uh, around the world. So welcome to everyone. What's wrong with the British media? Uh, well, uh, how long is a bit of string and how long have you got uh, I'm one of those who has long followed uh, the dictum of the Scottish writer Tom Nairn, who said not until the last editor is strangled by the last copy of the British newspapers will we be truly free. I, I wish them uh, no physical harm, of course, but as a metaphor, uh, that's pretty much uh, where I stand. Uh, of course, the good news is uh, no one needs to strangle the British newspapers these days because they have well and truly hanged themselves, a subject to which uh, I shall return. Uh, but uh, let me uh, enter uh, a couple of caveats uh, before I proceed. The first is that in 1945, when there was only one television station, and one radio station, and every single newspaper, with the exception uh, of the Daily Worker and the Daily Herald, which had uh, decent circulations, but nothing like the plethora uh, of their uh, opposition. Uh, Clement Attlee dumped uh, the great war leader, Winston Churchill, on his well upholstered backside, uh, despite uh, the unremitting hostility of the vast majority of the British media. And yet Labour won a landslide. Churchill, the hero of 10,000 newsreels uh, over the uh, preceding uh, six years, uh, five years at least, and who had personified uh, the country's uh, struggle against uh, Hitlerism and fascism, uh, which reached its apogee, of course, uh, this week in 1945, 75 years ago, and we'll be celebrating Victory Day on Saturday, May the 9th, online, and you're all invited back uh, for that. Uh, the hero of 10,000 newsreels was unceremoniously booted out of power. Now, admittedly, uh, the Left Book Club, uh, again to which I shall return, the Left Book Club uh, in the 30s uh, and uh, throughout the war uh, had ceded the ground uh, for a new and decisive turn uh, in British politics and British society. Admittedly, uh, cells of leftists and communists, socialists, had been active in the armed forces uh, throughout the war. Uh, but the real overwhelming reason why Labour under Attlee with a program that makes uh, Jeremy Corbyn's program for government look positively uh, Fabian uh, was that the British people had in their own minds uh, made a decisive turn. And they were not to be dissuaded uh, by the talk of Gestapo and all the other uh, foul electioneering of Churchill and the Conservatives and the right-wing press at that time. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make is uh, that one must never be fatalistic uh, about uh, the political situation. One must never look at the sea of hostility in the media and imagine that it is unvanquishable, uh, especially now uh, when we have many, many more tools 
at our disposal uh, than people did in 1945. To a lesser extent, in every regard, uh, Harold Wilson won two general elections in 1974 at a time when uh, the uh, security services were literally breaking into his residences, were bugging and burgling him all over London, and where even the publisher of the Daily Mirror was involved with uh, Lord Mountbatten and uh, other grandees in actual plots to stage a military coup against him and overthrow him and put the Prime Minister in prison. Uh, but Harold Wilson won not one but two general elections in February and October of 1974. This time, no Daily Herald. The Daily Herald had become the sun, if you can uh, imagine it. No Daily Worker. Uh, only the Morning Star, which was uh, a dim star indeed compared to the, the Daily Worker of 1945. That's important, I think, to uh, grasp. And thirdly, uh, at a time uh, when there was two uh, television stations and uh, not much more than two uh, radio stations, and where there was no Daily Mirror on the side of, uh, uh, on his side, uh, Tony Benn became the most popular political leader in the country, and in my view, the most popular political leader of the left that we have ever had in this country. I'm in a position to know, uh, because I was by his side, at his right hand, uh, as he traveled the length and breadth of the country in the early 1980s, Mr. Ben, in the teeth of literally total, absolutely total, media hostility, uh, which would regularly tell us uh, that uh, he was actually literally mad, uh, that he had driven himself mad by drinking uh, too much uh, tea, uh, and that... Uh, his ancestors were mad, and it, it must have genetically uh, transferred uh, down to him at a time when his fellow cabinet members uh, and shadow cabinet members uh, were telling anyone who listened that he was mad or bad or both, and quite possibly a Soviet agent uh, to boot. Uh, Mr. Ben built a mass following of millions of people uh, in Britain. And uh, you may have heard me tell you before uh, of uh, my travels with him, one in particular uh, in the obituary I recorded for him is worth uh, referring to in this regard. Uh, having said all of that, it's undoubtedly true uh, that the proliferation of television and radio stations and the, uh, the maintenance of a virtually universal, hostile uh, newspaper media uh, has undoubtedly uh, gotten worse. And there's no question uh, that the media played an important role, facilitated, of course, by the enemy within his own party, unaccountably uh, uh, including people that he had kept close to him and even promoted people like Keir Starmer, uh, for example, uh, played an important role, though I argue not the most important role, in the defenestration uh, of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the Julian Assange case is another case in point, where the mass media uh, has uh, turned on Julian Assange uh, in a, a Pavlovian way and uh, may very well succeed in hunting him either to an early, untimely death in Belmarsh Prison or to a living death in the dungeons uh, of the United States. Um, the very day that we're in is further uh, example. Uh, the BBC, the state broadcaster, had not, at least by 5 p.m. today, 
reported on any of their portals that Britain had just become the second worst coronavirus black spot in the entire world, had overtaken, and we're always told we're two weeks behind Italy, had overtaken Italy for the greatest number of deaths. And if you follow the FT, which I do religiously, uh, you'll see today that their prediction, uh, based on uh, their numerology, which I think is much more dependable, either than the ONS or the NHS, and still more the British government spokespeople themselves, our death toll has reached 55,000. Uh, in other words, not that far short uh, of the United States figure, uh, though they have many times the multiple of our uh, population. Uh, and uh, at least until 5 p.m., I don't know if they have now done so, but they completely ignored uh, this uh, rather salient fact, preferring to show us snaps of the Prime Minister out for a walk in St. James's Park and other such uh, ephemera. Now, the uh, British media, therefore, has always been hostile to socialism, but has not always prevailed in defeating socialist ideas, in defeating in elections, uh, parties to which they were entirely hostile. Uh, and so this, I think, is the framework uh, of uh, tonight's discussion. I'm going to uh, say, it's a bold prediction, but I'm going to say that the British newspaper market will not recover uh, from its current travails. Uh, the sun, which was formerly the Daily Herald, and then absolutely the brightest uh, planet in the newspaper uh, firmament by a very long way, uh, selling at one point five, maybe six million uh, copies a day, uh, is now just over one million copies a day, and this year lost 64 million pounds. Uh, and it's true that Rupert Murdoch uh, has ink on his fingers and doesn't like to uh, relinquish uh, newspapers, although he proved in the News of the World case that he sometimes knows when the game is up. It's my prediction that the sun will be sacrificed, and if I were working at the sun, and if Tom uh, Newton Dunn is watching now, I'd definitely be uh, at least tentatively looking around uh, for a new job. In fact, the times will become uh, the new sun, the new uh, flagship and Times Radio, uh, formerly Talk Radio, uh, or at least utilizing some of the resources of Talk Radio, will become Murdoch's main uh, flagship uh, in the in the media market. Uh, but all of the other papers. Uh, some people ask me, why does the Daily Express keep showcasing uh, my uh, television work? Why do they? Why is the Daily Express of all the newspapers? Uh, continually running my videos. And the reason is, my videos are the only ones that get anyone to look at the Daily Express. Uh, almost literally, that is the long and the short of it. Uh, the people who watch my videos on the Daily Express portal dwarf, absolutely dwarf, uh, the people who are working for the Daily Express. The uh, newspaper market is shot through. And so Tom Nairn's uh, dearest wish uh, of the strangling of the last editor uh, with the last copy is pretty much uh, upon us. And uh, uh, if I live a normal lifespan, uh, I expect the time to come uh, that I will go into uh, petrol stations and supermarkets and news agents, if there are any of those left, and see no newspapers at all uh, on the shelves. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking uh, about them, because television and radio are far, far more important. Of course, the enemy television and radio stations use the popular prejudices paraded every day in the newspapers as the basis for their broadcasting. That's true. Right from late at night when Sky reviews 
uh, the next day's newspapers. I can tell you, as someone who formerly worked in the field, uh, that when you come in to, not my shows, because I don't, but all the other presenters have a pile of newspapers uh, on their desk uh, because they are stuck for words often, and they find those words, they find the stories uh, that are, uh, are of importance to them and to the uh, audience in the newspaper. So that will have to change. But television and radio are the future. And again, there's good news here. Uh, because the, cost, the reason why it took to the 1970s before there was a second TV station uh, and into the 1980s before there was a third uh, TV station and into this century uh, before there was this plethora of television stations is that the cost of entry was very, very high. You needed to own a lot of hardware and then later a lot of money for satellite time in order to have a TV station. But all of that, as this broadcast <laughs> proves, I'm broadcasting to you for free, and you are watching me for free, and you can interact with me for free. So actually, the cost of entry has not just fallen, it has effectively disappeared. Uh, now, uh, just before you uh, uh, join me, uh, until seconds before you joined me, I was uh, paying uh, Sky some more money, uh, not that much more, uh, to get uh, an even better, faster uh, internet speed. And of course, uh, there's still a way to travel uh, before the quality of these pictures uh, will be as good, the quality of the audio will be as good as you're used to uh, on terrestrial, on satellite television. We are well down the road. Uh, towards a time when that will be true. And that means we have our own television stations. We have our own radio stations. Oh, wait, I already do. Uh, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was being sacked by talk radio because I have gone from an audience of some 30,000, 30, 30 on talk radio, to an audience of in excess of half a million every Sunday uh, with the mother of all talk shows. And famously, on one occasion, 1.17 million viewers, never mind the listeners who are listening on radio, FM in Washington, D.C., AM across America, or online on SputnikNews.com. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I'm better paid. Uh, and I'm absolutely free. Uh, and there's no Ofcom uh, to interfere in my output. Only decency and ethics uh, police my uh, output uh, on the mother of all talk shows. And other people are now catching on. And so uh, a thousand flowers will bloom uh, in this garden. And therefore, we need to turn our attention... Uh, to the quality of the output. Because you know the song, 300 channels and nothing on. Uh, well, we must make sure that in this new era, that's not true of us as it was true of them. So our graphics have to be uh, tip-top. Our camera work, our microphones uh, have to be tip-top. Our marketing of our product has to be tip-top. But all of these things are as nothing if uh, somebody comes on and reads in a monotone voice out of the London telephone directory, if such a directory still exists. It's got to be good content if you're going to grab the audience, keep them coming back, and grow the audience. And that means uh, applying the creative uh, spirit that is within all of us uh, to this new challenge. And already we're seeing that in microcosm, in our work uh, elsewhere on social media. Uh, the, my followers, well over a million followers on social media. Uh, it's not every post is as good as the one before it, of course. Uh, not every video is as good as it could or should be. But by and large, I'm keeping my audience growing and growing on social media because the content 
is good. It is not a prolix recitation of, uh, of uh, ideological perspectives. It is not an unending, ceaseless uh, parade of dead Russians or Germans, though there's a place, of course, uh, for uh, parading. And on this day, uh, we celebrate uh, the uh, birthday of the greatest of them all, the greatest German of them all, the greatest philosopher uh, of them all, the greatest, the father of socialism, Karl Marx, whose birthday is today. But uh, you'll never build a big audience uh, reading from Das Kapital, uh, although I see one of our members is doing a daily Mao. I must tune into that. It might be fun, uh, but it can't be the whole content. Uh, so that's why some of you may be surprised. I, I intersperse my output uh, with a picture of my kids playing football or my wife at the, at the, uh, at the hospital uh, today for her uh, midwife's uh, appointment. I drop in uh, my, uh, my affection for Bob Dylan or I circulate some wonderful goals uh, scored uh, mainly by Manchester United and Celtic, but not only uh, them. I'm quite Catholic about that as other things. Uh, and I talk about today's uh, politics, but I also talk about 75 years ago uh, politics. I talk about 300 years ago politics. I try, in other words, uh, light and shade uh, to uh, keep the viewers' attention and to keep the viewers coming back. And that's what our output uh, has to be. Uh, it has to be human in scale, uh, human interest. Uh, is a thing that will never wane, thank God, or we would cease to be human. Uh, we care uh, that somebody's sister died. Uh, we ache that somebody's husband is in a, a coma. We send each other greetings and, and goodwill and so on. These are all human things uh, which will make a, a very big difference. And I expect Again, if God spares me, I expect that the uh, 1.17 million audience for the mother of all talk shows will one day, uh, perhaps not that distant, uh, become the norm. And now I want to put that in perspective for you. 1.17 million is a bigger audience uh, than any, any political broadcast on the so-called mainstream British media. It's bigger than Marr, it's bigger than Peston, it's bigger than Andrew Neil, it's bigger than Channel 4 News, and so on. It's important that because some of you may think, you know, I'm operating at the periphery, operating at the edges, because some people say to me, I wish we could get you more often uh, onto Marr uh, or onto Channel 4 News. Why? I'm reaching more people without being on these uh, channels. So I suppose in that sense, I'm trying to encourage you uh, that we are by no means outlaws on the periphery, uh, that only the peripheral people are paying attention to. Of course, we're a long way uh, from, uh, from the audience of, of Love Island. They say that um, every cloud has a silver lining and I see that they have just cancelled the season of Love Island. Uh, we have not yet grabbed the attention of the mass of the uh, British people. But we have grabbed the attention uh, of the avant-garde, if you like, the advance guard, uh, or the most politically conscious, the most politically interested people in the land. That's why our numbers are so good. And uh, that's not any mean achievement, as we are hated uh, by the establishment, we are hated by New Labour, we are hated by the official trade unions, we are hated by the Liberals, we are hated by the FBPE lunatics, we are hated by the Trotskyists, we are hated by the anarchists, we are hated by the David Icheists. And yet, and yet, here we are, 
with our uh, fixed uh, political position, ironclad, unwavering, immovable, absolutely determined, and we have the audience that none of these other people have, and we must make uh, good use of it. So as I've said to you before, uh, be smart on social media. I see some of our people not being smart. I don't uh, reprimand them uh, in public, uh, and so I won't single them out now as some of the public are watching. But please don't get drawn into interminable, uh, long uh, uh, polemics with people uh, from whom it's really obvious at a glance, at least at a glance from me, uh, that these people are not people that can be persuaded, not people that can be won over, and they are wasting your time uh, uh, in uh, drawing uh, into uh, an interminable argument. It's quite easy, if you apply your mind to it, to know whether someone is genuinely unknowing and with uh, a little bit of uh, uh, presentation or factual material or reference uh, to uh, other sources and so on can be neutralized or won. Uh, it's quite easy to differentiate between such people and the people that I see some of you arguing with. And uh, although I fall foul of this myself from time to time, please don't swear when you've got the uh, Workers' Party logo uh, on your uh, social media. Uh, please make no uh, unseemly uh, uh, or obscene uh, references and so on, because it reflects badly uh, on us. And it reflects badly on me because I'm not uh, reprimanding you there and then. Um, be smart on social media and put your minds to how you can improve your content. You see, in 25 seconds, that's all, with just a telephone, I put out a video for this meeting uh, tonight. It took me 25 seconds. In fact, 25 seconds is a good length, especially for Instagram. Uh, all of you can make those videos. I saw one of our comrades, uh, Georgie. Uh, um, I'm not sure where she is. I hope she's watching uh, tonight. She was just walking through our garden, uh, being a, a normal woman uh, and talking normally, absolutely sanely uh, about socialism and about the Workers' Party. And it was, it was a thing of beauty. Now, you can all do that. All of you can do it. The more very short, good videos that you can make, good graphics that you can make. Our Grimsby boys, uh, uh, our, our Charlie and Danny are just masterful uh, at this. If, uh, if I were to win the lottery, I'd employ them full time and pay them a wage uh, to do it. Uh, and uh, graphics, pictures, moving pictures, video, audio, that's the way uh, forward. Of course, there'll always be a place for the pronunciamento. I do a fair bit of it myself. Uh, try not to put too many capital letters in and too many exclamation marks uh, either. In other words, think smart, be smart, practice. And the better our output is, the more people we will attract. Now, of course, the mainstream media will go on, although advertising revenues in the independent sector are uh, catastrophic and about to get more catastrophic still, uh, but they'll still manage to go on and they'll squeeze uh, some politics and some news into their schedules, even though they are uh, money losers. They're loss leaders, actually to uh, persuade the state uh, to keep on giving them what was in the past a license to print money. Uh, but uh, the radio stations and the television stations are losing audience. We are the ones who are gaining audience. And I think that that is going to continue. So shorter than normal, because I want the maximum number of contributions on this, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, tuning in, and I'm, I'm all yours.
Thanks, George. I think that was a fantastic opening to the meeting and a, a lot of great points over there. And we've had some really good and interesting questions about the mainstream media, social media in general. So one question coming from uh, Bill F. He wants to know, uh, the British media is a microcosm of all that is wrong with British society. Entrenched classism, prevalence of an old school tie network and embittered middle class snobbery and belittling of the work, working class. Moreover, people do not even receive the benefit of receiving trusted information on which to base decisions. How will this be overcome in the 21st century in a way that will benefit the ordinary worker and ensure meritocracy prevails? Well, uh, for example, uh, a poll uh, was uh, recently taken uh, which uh, showed uh, the various parts of the uh, four estates uh, which were trusted by people in relation to the coronavirus. And by a very large distance indeed, broadcast and print journalists came at the bottom of the pile. Something like 17% of those polls trusted, those polls trusted the newspaper and broadcast media for information. These are catastrophically low levels. Uh, the journalists themselves were shocked by this poll. I saw one of them, Ian Dale on, uh, on LBC, uh, say that he, he would have to pause and reflect uh, to find himself a, a member of such a widely despised professional group. Uh, some of them affected not to know how it is that they became so despised. I believe that the turning point on this as on much else in our uh, uh, political uh, world realm uh, here in this country and to an extent in the United States uh, was the Iraq war. Uh, I said at the time after the Iraq war that nothing would ever be the same again. And I'm saying it now after the coronavirus, uh, that will be true even more. And so those of us who have uh, taken a consistent line, uh, a logical and reasonable line. By reasonable, I mean uh, staying on the side of reason and thought and science and fact instead of departing to the four winds, uh, chasing moonbeams of conspiracy theories uh, and the rest, will get the reward for that. It takes a long time to become a trusted source. It takes a long time and a consistent track record uh, before people uh, more or less automatically uh, trust you. Uh, I, I have some attributes uh, that God gave me and others that I've uh, learned over a very long life. But the most important attribute I have, and it's reflected in my post bag, it's reflected on the call-ins to my shows and so on, is that people believe that I'm honest. Uh, they don't believe that I'm saying something in which I don't believe. They don't believe I'm saying something because somebody paid me to do it or because uh, I'm afraid to say otherwise. So I may be right, I may be wrong on something, but people trust the fact uh, that I'm telling you what I genuinely think. And it takes a long time to build that reputation, uh, but it takes no time at all to lose such a reputation. And I think the British media has comprehensively and for all time uh, lost any reputation uh, that they had. As a matter of fact, the reputation was ill-deserved. I was brought up in a house that thought the sun shone out of the BBC's arse. Uh, I was not even allowed to watch ITV. I have not until this day ever seen a, an episode of Coronation Street. If my parents caught us watching ITV, they switched it over immediately. Uh, uh, now, that was ill-deserved, actually, uh, because the BBC has always been, since its foundation, as a strike-breaking tool in the general strike in 1926, has always been a tool of the establishment, but somehow it built a reputation. Uh, but it's lost it now uh, completely. Well done, Laura Kunzberg uh, and... Co. And it will never get it back again. Uh, so uh, the questioner asks, what can we do? Uh, well, I've spent a lot of time tonight saying what we can do. We must 
do it ourselves. We can never expect a fair crack of the whip from the enemy. Uh, why should we? Uh, why should they give us a fair crack of the whip? If you think about it, it's only their hypocrisy that even made them pretend to do so. Because we're, we mean it. The Workers' Party of Britain really means it. If we can, we will take away your power and a very great deal of your wealth. And we will absolutely change uh, the role that you have made our country play in the world. Why should they help us with that, if you think about it? We have to do it ourselves. Thanks, George. And uh, the next question comes uh, from George Dragon. Go ahead. George, George. well done. Uh, you're right, George. How's it going? Um, Good, yeah. mate. So basically, obviously, we have a very, very wide reach when it comes to uh, Twitter, when it comes to moats, uh, when it comes to RT, you know, all the different channels we have. Um, but obviously, with those channels, it's mostly kind of the left wing socialist progressive uh, sort of circle the reaching. So do you think um, a bit of a push into the, the more mainstream channels like, you know, Good Morning Britain and things like that would actually help us to reach those who aren't really following the political sphere like we do? Well, uh, if, uh, if uh, Piers Morgan uh, calls me, uh, and he does from time to time, uh, to go on uh, Good Morning Britain, of course, I, uh, I jump at the chance because it has uh, a considerable uh, audience. Um, Jeremy Vine is the only other person in the mainstream media that occasionally uh, brings me on his Radio 2 uh, show, uh, uh, the, the Jeremy Vine show. And, uh, of course, I always uh, take it up. Uh, but uh, these are the only two. It's been years since I've been on BBC News, years since I've been on Sky News, years since I've been on Question Time, and I'm not expecting that to uh, change. But I must correct you, Georgie, on something. Uh, as the results of our polls on moats show, it is not at all the case that everyone watching and listening is on the left or is a socialist, is a convert. Not at all. In fact, if I was to extrapolate from the polls that we run, about half of the people watching and listening are not. Now, that must be true in the United States, uh, even more than it might be true in Britain. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it is the case uh, that I have a following uh, of people who want to hear what I've got to say for the reasons I explained earlier, even if they don't agree with it. And when they do agree with it, they frequently opine, I never thought I'd agree with Galloway, but... If I had a pound for every person that has said that in my life over the last 20 years or so especially, I'd be exceedingly rich indeed. Uh, so uh, we, as I said at the opening meeting of the Workers' Party, we don't write off anyone. We don't write someone off uh, because of incorrectness in their language. We don't write someone off because they may have voted a certain way in the past. We pursue with good faith anyone who will listen to us to try to win them. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I get exasperated. I got pretty exasperated against uh, someone that uh, has been following me a long time and whom I muted uh, earlier today. Uh, and she'll be upset about it, and I'm a bit upset about it. But I believe I was rich uh, in, uh, I was absolutely, uh, it was richly deserved uh, because it is the feeling still amongst some uh, that our purpose in the Workers' Party is to collect uh, the 57 varieties of leftist uh, that exists in this country and bring them into one fold. Well, I can't speak for all of the leaders of the Workers' Party, and there's been no formal discussion about this point, uh, but I honestly could think of nothing more nightmarish, nothing more hellish than gathering in one place 
the 57 varieties of lefties uh, that exist in this country. I'm actually, uh, if I'm being perfectly honest, and while no one's listening or watching, I couldn't care less for most pre-existing lefties. I want to go after the working class. I want to win the working class, which would never describe themselves as lefty. In fact, such a dirty word has left become, uh, they would run a mile from the idea uh, that they are leftists. I don't even like to use the word leftist anymore. I'm a socialist. I believe in a socialist future. But above all, I believe in the working class. And so I don't ask the, the bus drivers if they're leftists or if they're socialists before I join with them in the battle for PPE uh, in the current uh, crisis. I saw our postie today, a woman a postal uh, a worker, uh, going around pushing her trolley, no mask, no gloves, going from house to house, handling paper, on which the virus could very well be uh, lying, uh, with absolutely no PPE of any kind. I'm with her, whatever her political views. She may be exceedingly unsound, for all I know, uh, on, uh, I don't know, sexual politics, racial politics, uh, gender politics. She may be. That's not important to me. I'll deal with that later, further down the line. It's my job to persuade her that she can come with us. She can combine with us. She can be a part of us. And she'll be stronger for it uh, if she is. Sorry, that went on too long. Beg your pardon. It's fantastic, George. Uh, yeah, fantastic points. Um, we have a really interesting question from Matthew Burroughs. So when you're ready, Matthew, far away. You hear me okay? Yep. You hear yes. Me? Great. Yes. Hi, George. Um, what it is is, um, I mean, back in the 60s, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the, there was a... Um, a way for the working class people to get into acting or directing things to, you know, for instance, like I know for a fact that uh, John Hurt and Ian McShane got like a bursary to go to uh, so that they could study. Now all that seems closed off. I have nothing against Benedict Cumberbatch. I think he's a fine actor. I have nothing against Tom Hardy, but they're public school boys. And the fact is all this seems to be closed off. We haven't got any Lindsay Andersons. We haven't got any Ken Loachers. Uh, we've got we've, we've still got Ken Loach, but where is the next wave of these people who should be going into the arts? Chris Eccleston's way raised this point. There are no working class actors getting into acting and becoming stars anymore. Um, and I think it's a disgrace. You know, I, I'm just wondering what you thought about that. Well, uh, I, 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 my first point is I'm exceedingly disappointed to learn that Tom Hardy is a public schoolboy because I absolutely love him as a, an actor, as a, as a film star. In fact, I'm watching him uh, on Taboo uh, on the television uh, late tonight. Uh, so uh, the point that you make is uh, abundantly clear. Uh, we've still got Ken Loach, but uh, he's no spring chicken. Uh, and uh, his best years of filmmaking are behind him. Uh, so we need more Ken Loaches. And I feel sure that uh, the, uh, this uh, artistic uh, wave uh, inside the working class has uh, by no means uh, ended. We, we have uh, one very close to us, Chris McGlade, uh, who took uh, the, the West End by storm uh, just before the coronavirus was about to break into uh, into Hollywood, hope that hasn't gone away when the virus uh, does. Uh, uh, and, you know, people who think like us are many. Uh, they, are, uh, they are many millions, and they are uh, children not yet uh, in the political uh, sphere uh, are no doubt uh, thinking artistically. We've got uh, Alex Wilmot. We've got Guy, uh, who I hope are both watching now. Maybe you and they uh, should get together and produce a paper for us, just charting uh, the, the spaces that have disappeared 
uh, the opportunities that are no longer there. Uh, and that will help us put together an arts a policy, and that would be a good thing, I think. Thanks, George. And we have uh, a couple of questions written in here from uh, Mark Adkins. Uh, why do the media only ever interview parents and children that are keen for schools to reopen? Capitalism seems to have made enjoying spending time with your children taboo. Very good point. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, clearly been a, a, a turn uh, amongst the ruling elite, the establishment, business, uh, to uh, force the working class into uh, potentially uh, fatal workplaces uh, in order to save uh, what's left uh, of capitalism. Uh, because we exist to defend the workers, uh, we resist this. Uh, and we, uh, we, we make no apology uh, for it. It's not our job to save capitalism. If Richard Branson cannot uh, uh, stand on his own two feet, uh, then uh, he must fall. And uh, the state may well then pick up the pieces and uh, to some extent uh, will do. Uh, so uh, we stand against uh, this drive, uh, which is clearly on uh, to stampede our people back to work, back to school uh, before it's safe to do so. And uh, we will not waver uh, from that. Of course, we, uh, we demand uh, the, the financial wherewithal uh, to uh, allow our people to uh, stay at home. And there has been some success in that. 80% of your wage uh, up to 2,500 uh, a month is uh, paid by the state uh, is, uh, is not a small thing. Uh, and it's, uh, it was fear of the response of the working class, uh, which made the Tories do that. It should be 100% uh, of, uh, of your wages. And we will not uh, tire of pointing that out, uh, but we will, not, uh, we will not waver. And now uh, Italy and Spain uh, have uh, now gone back to work. There are a couple of weeks in terms of the curve uh, of the whole thing uh, ahead of us. I'd be very surprised indeed if there's not another massive spike in infection and death in Italy and Spain. And so uh, I will not support uh, a return uh, to the front uh, by uh, the mass of the workers uh, whilst there's still such a danger to their health and even to their life, as well as, of course, continuing to demand the full PPE for those key workers, critical workers, who must work, uh, but who are so powerlessly under-protected at this point in time. Thanks, George. And a question coming from Gavin Hawkton. There is so much disinformation and hegemonic narratives within our media that distort the case for socialism. How can the Workers' Party cut through the noise and reach out to the wider public. How important is social media on this point? Oh, totally, uh, crucially, and, uh, and just argue for good things. You don't need to wrap it up in isms. You don't need to wrap it up in, uh, in, uh, in ideological language. Uh, just propose things which would be good, which would be good for the people, and the people can be persuaded of it. And we are already a long way down the road on that. Uh, the, the numbers of people in Britain supporting the renationalization of the utilities that were stolen from us is enormous. Uh, the demand for the renationalization of the railways is even bigger uh, than for the renationalization of the utilities. And here I come to uh, a USP of ours. Everybody else, Labour, are demanding uh, the defense of the National Health Service. We're different. We demand the renationalization of the National Health Service. We do not pretend that the National Health Service we have today is wonderful 
we think it's wonderful minus all the underfunding and privatization that has gone on to date. We, unlike Labour, don't pretend that this problem be began with David Cameron in 2010. So every time you hear someone mention uh, that the Tories and austerity have uh, gutted the NHS, point out that it's 40 years, not 10 years, of privatization, PFIs, underfunding, and the systematic perversion of the idea of a national health service, uh, which is personified in uh, Stuart Stephen, uh, the, uh, the US uh, private healthcare boss who's now in charge of our national health service. So we are not defending the status quo in the national health service. We're demanding a return to the status quo ante, which existed before that 40 years of privatization, part and full uh, of the National Health Service. But our position and the position of Labour uh, to defend the NHS, well, um, who doesn't support that? That's why I was interviewed earlier about uh, 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 the, the trade talks uh, with the United States. Some people still say, you know, the Tories will, uh, will try and uh, bring the Yanks openly into the, uh, into the NHS. They will not do so. Uh, they cannot afford the risk of uh, doing so. In any case, they're already salami style, slice by slice, uh, doing quite well uh, on that. And they've un intensified their efforts in that regard during the period of the coronavirus, imagine. Uh, but they will not openly, full frontally, bring in the Americans uh, to run our health service. Uh, neither will they openly uh, say that they want to privatize it. Better to do it by stealth. Uh, ideas like the right to dignity for our old people have been enormously strengthened uh, by recent events. That thousands of our old people should be stuck in what are effectively granny farms uh, where they are not just there waiting to die, but are actually being killed uh, by the failure of these places to protect them. And the big failure of the NHS throwing people out of hospital into these homes. That will be another very uh, fruitful uh, front uh, for us uh, that we intend fully to uh, develop uh, our ideas uh, on this. Uh, we want to recover the idea that the state should help families to keep their elderly with them. Of course, it's not possible in every case. Uh, some elderly don't have families. Uh, some elderly are simply unmanageable. Uh, at home with their families. But a large number of our elderly should have had no need to be put in these places in the first place. One of the extents to which Eastern societies are superior to Western societies in the respect uh, that they give to their elders and the, uh, the fact that they would never, I mean, it would literally, uh, my wife is from uh, Indonesia as people will know. It is literally incomprehensible uh, to an Indonesian family uh, that their parent would be put off into a home uh, to live out the last uh, days of their life. This kind of argument uh, will become uh, a much more salient uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the future. So uh, I, I believe that socialist ideas are popular ideas because they are rational ideas. I know it's a bit trite, but I may have heard Mr. Ben say this a thousand times. I could even mimic his voice in saying it. There's 12 of us adrift on a lifeboat. There's limited food, there's limited water. How do we distribute the limited food and water on board our 12-person lifeboat. 
We can sell it and only the rich will eat and drink. We can fight for it and only the strong will eat and drink. Or we can distribute it fairly according to need amongst each other. That, Mr. Ben used to say, is socialism. Socialism. It's trite, but it's good. Fantastic quote, I think. And people can go back to the Workers' Party uh, launch videos on the Workers' Party Britain YouTube channel to see uh, our opening rally with Dr. Bob Gill, who does a fantastic job, uh, especially in his new documentary, The Great NHS Heist, of going over everything that is happening to the NHS and everything that has happened to the NHS. It's a very eye-opening watch, so people should definitely go back and watch that when they get a chance. And we have a, a question from Georgina Harrison. Oh, that's me. Ah, Hi. Georgie, it's you. Hi, can you hear me, George? Very clearly, thank you. Excellent. Um, thanks for plugging my video earlier. I'm famous now, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying the meeting a lot. Um, I just wanted to ask, when... There's a plethora, to use your word, of lots of socialist stroke left wingy type publications out there. And I get what you're saying about using media and social media instead. But I would love it if we had a paper that I could sort of gently display in the ward and sort of sort of get rid of their sons and their daily expresses and daily mails and say, oh, have a look at this, dear. It's got such and such an item in it. Um, so really, and also with people like myself that I'm not really up on learning about imperialism and all the other bits and bobs, just ordinary workers, they might be sort of put off from something, say, like the Daily, not Daily Star, the Morning Star, and certainly would be put off by the Daily Star. Have you got any sort of suggestions of maybe having our own newspaper, but like a decent one, <laughs> if that makes any sense? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't recommend any uh, newspaper, uh, and I'm, I'm not a fan uh, of newspapers, though uh, there are others in the leadership of the Workers' Party who do like to get their hands dirty on the printing press, and they do like the feel of paper uh, more than I do. Uh, so uh, uh, you're pushing out an open door with them. Uh, I think uh, they, when it's... Uh, possible to do so. Uh, the British worker uh, will be available. Uh, it won't be a newspaper in the sense uh, that, uh, you know, the socialist worker or uh, that kind of uh, stuff will be. Uh, it'll be sh smaller and shorter uh, um, and uh, it will not cost as much, won't cost anything at all, I think. Uh, um, and I'm sure that we will uh, do that. Uh, I, my days of uh, newspaper selling are definitely over. I'll stick to the uh, TV and radio, but I take your point very much, Georgie. Fantastic. Thanks, George. And a uh, question from Gavin Dobson. Go ahead, Gavin. Hi, George. Hi, Gavin. Hi, George. How are you doing? You all right? Yes, good. Thanks. Good, good. So, good question for you. It's Bit similar to George's actually. Uh, with the likes of the uh, newspapers like uh, Daily Mail, The Sun, they all seem to follow their agenda, i.e., follow the political parties of the Conservatives, um, Daily Mirror, Guardian, sort of more liberal, Labour Party, that's what they kind of follow. When do you think we'll have an independent free press that is free from political bias? Is my question to you, George. Well, never, uh, because if you think about it, who would go to the trouble, uh, especially when it isn't even profitable, uh, to produce a newspaper if it were not for uh, reasons of uh, proselytizing for their own political bias? Uh, there would be no other reason to do it. If we started a newspaper, it would be a newspaper reflecting our uh, political bias. So there's no point in uh, wishing for... Uh, an unbiased uh, press. There never has been. Uh, but what there is, has been, uh, are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, you mentioned the very worst of them. The Guardian is utter poison. 
much more poisonous than the Daily Mail because the Daily Mail is not pretending to be a sheep whilst being a wolf. The Guardian is a wolf pretending to be a sheep. Uh, so I, I read online the Daily Mail all day. Uh, I, I, I go back to it probably hourly uh, because it has a lot of journalists, a lot of photographers, a lot of staff. This I know, I used to write a column in it for many years. Uh, and so I know where they're coming from politically. So I'm able to sift uh, the uh, politics from the news. I'm able to understand why the paper, with its political line, is approaching this subject uh, in uh, this way. Uh, whereas with The Guardian, of course, uh, the supposition of most readers is that this is a progressive paper. It is a poisonous, rancorous, treacherous, utterly, utterly reprehensible rag. No one should ever buy it. No one should ever retweet it. If you have to, just like uh, the story which includes it. It, it, is, it is the worst of all the newspapers in Britain, including the Daily Star, by a long, long way. Thanks, George. And we have uh, a couple of writing questions. Uh, one from Mara. Do you think the bias in British media is of a corporate nature, innate to the financial interests and the nature of neoliberalism? Or do you think it's a more corroborated campaign coming from the government with the specific goal of directing public opinion in one specific direction. Do you think the media is directly controlled by the government as their unity of opinion on war and international policy in general might suggest? No, I don't believe the media is directly controlled by the government. And I mentioned the uh, Daily Mail uh, earlier. The Daily Mail is currently the most trenchant critic of the government's handling of the coronavirus uh, by, by a long chalk, by a country mile. Uh, and that's partly because Piers Morgan uh, writes for them, but uh, it's also in the, in the timber, in the bones of the, of the editorial line. Uh, it's, uh, it's partly because the, the mail uh, represents a lot of people at risk. It's bought by, uh, its customers are older people, uh, um, and uh, many of them feel uh, that they have been let down, that their interests have not been protected uh, by the government. And the mail is always, has always been very much in tune with its readers. Uh, it's uh, in that sense quite reader led. Uh, it's historically known, for example, as, as a woman's paper. Uh, it has a very, very much higher percentage of women readers than any other newspaper. And that's reflected in the choice of stories uh, that they cover and the way in which they treat those uh, stories. No, I don't believe the government controls the press. Uh, I believe that the government and the press just all face in the same direction, fundamentally. Uh, they all face uh, the direction uh, of, uh, of uh, free market economics. Uh, they all face the direction of American hegemony in foreign policy. Uh, in neoliberal economics, neocon foreign policy is their instinctive uh, stance. Now I speak of the owners uh, and of course the government, but what uh, uh, Mara's question does raise uh, is an interesting and unfathomable fact. The people who work, the hirelings who work for these proprietors are oftentimes uh, people from uh, the lower middle class, uh, upper working class, some of them industrial working class, blue collar working class, uh, children, sons and daughters, uh, who go into working for these institutions and grow up uh, in the 
ugliest possible way uh, to be uh, f basically shooting a breeze in which they have themselves no interest. Journalists today have never had a more precarious uh, professional uh, position. Never. Journalists are on short-term contracts, almost all of them. Uh, they are uh, increasingly hanging on to their positions uh, for uh, grim life, grim death, however you say it. Uh, they are, uh, uh, any week they could come in and get their notice, get their jotters. Uh, they are uh, treated increasingly uh, like, uh, like uh, they were already artificial intelligence, uh, which uh, many of their jobs will soon be done by. Uh, that's a more philosophical question. I'm not qualified to answer it. But I'm bound to tell you uh, that I have never known a time where journalists as a group were more reprehensible than the journalistic cohort uh, today. There was always, and I've been in politics 50 years, there was always on every paper two, three, four, five, ten uh, people that were sympathetic to uh, our political positions, even if their title uh, was uh, ex extremely hostile to it. And one could always get hands up, heads up rather, uh, from them. Something's coming in the morning. Even the, the Daily Telegraph assault on me that cost them 2.3 million pounds in damages and costs. I knew about this attack uh, before it happened uh, because even in the Daily Telegraph there were people who were sympathetic to us, uh, who gave us a heads up uh, about it. So uh, that's not true anymore. That's really not true anymore. I can think literally of no one, no one at all in The Guardian, in The Daily Mirror, in The Daily Mail, or any paper. I can think of no one working in the BBC or in Channel 4 News uh, that has any sympathy whatsoever for the causes that we stand for. And that is a new thing. And it's a paradox because the more they do uh, their, uh, the bidding of their masters, the sharper their masters are making the very knives that will soon sever uh, their connection to these individuals. It's uh, lemming-like suicide uh, behavior, uh, but that's what they are doing. I've never known a worse time for written and broadcast journalism in this country, ever. Fantastic. Thank you, George. Lots of good feedback from the members in the chat. Everyone's enjoying the meeting, and uh, our viewing figures uh, have been going up over the evening as well, so it's drawing in a, a lot of people. So uh, we're actually uh, creating the new media here, I think, which is great. Uh, yeah. Nadia, a uh, question from Nadia, are you able to go ahead? Uh, hello, George Galloway. Uh, you're my childhood hero, so I'm quite nervous. Um, just a question to you. Um, from turning an anti-racist like Corbyn to an anti-Semite and a racist via, the, via their relentlessness, um, you know, via the panorama, documentary and news packages, uh, how can the Workers' Party fight against this, and what does the future hold for the BBC? Sorry, it's my baby in the background. <laughs> oh, yeah. we, uh, you may not know this, but our party has a higher proportion of husbands and wives and children of any political organization I have ever known. So we encourage children crying in the background. Uh, my own are uh, um, uh, listening to this now, uh, and quite quietly. Uh, so uh, never feel uh, shy about that, about bringing your children to our events. They're always welcome. Uh, and we, we, we like couples to be involved as couples too, uh, because that's the kind of society we want to build. And therefore, our party should act and be like 
the society uh, we want to uh, build. Um, well, of course, your question was predicated on the word fight. You said, how can the Workers' Party fight against that? Well, that's the operative word, you see. You have to fight. And Jeremy Corbyn did not fight. He never once fought against the notion uh, that he, his friends, his ideology uh, was, uh, was anti-Semitic. He never once did what I did over and over again on Sky News, on talk radio. He never once went on the offensive and said, how dare you call me an anti-Semite because I oppose the stealing of Palestinian land, the massacre of Palestinian children, uh, the racist apartheid nature of the state of Israel. He never did any of that. In fact, he made it illegal to say those words that I have just said. He made it an expellable offense to say the things that he'd been saying for 30 years or more prior to becoming leader of the Labour Party. So the first thing, Nadia, that you have to do is fight. And you have to fight persuasively. If you run away, in Glasgow we say, if you don't run, they can't chase you. And if you run, they will chase you. And they'll chase you until you have no fight left and fall upon you and devour you. And that's exactly what they did to Jeremy Corbyn. Far from defending himself, far from fighting, he threw one after the other his own friends, starting with me, under the bus, rather than fight uh, the fake, false, entirely constructed charge uh, of anti-Semitism uh, against him. Not because anti-Semitism is not a thing. Matter of fact, I'm here to tell you it's more of a thing than most of you actually yet know. Uh, I've studied this very, very closely, and I'm in a good position to. Anti-Semitism on the left is a thing. It's not the same as the anti-Semitism on the right. It's a morphing of anti-capitalist, anti-finance capital, anti-Israel feelings, which in some people comes out of their mouths, from their brains, in anti-Semitic thought and speech. Not expressed in the way that the Hitlerites did, but nonetheless uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, when I read someone say, hear someone say, Rothschild, I immediately reach uh, for the dial uh, because this almost always displays that the person using it has disappeared down that rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and hunting for cults and Illuminati and New World Order. And a lot of it is code for Jews. So anti-Semitism is a thing. I myself think Corbyn was slow to uh, conclude uh, that point. Uh, I would myself have uh, dealt with the uh, examples of anti-Semitism that were truly anti-Semitism much more quickly and much more ruthlessly than he did. But the truth is that the campaign against Corbyn was not about anti-Semitism, what was about defending Israel. The Board of Deputies' number one priority is defending Israel. And the uh, Israel lobby in this country, is the, the Nick Clue being in the name, has as its first priority the protection of Israel. And that's why they went after Jeremy Corbyn, and he did not fight it, to use your word, Nadia. So the first thing we'd do is fight it. The second thing we'd do is make sure that we never, wittingly or unwittingly, 
fall into the trap of endorsing, retweeting, liking ideas and imagery, which is, in essence, anti-Semitic. The third thing we do is establish in the mind of the fair-minded listener that actually the best solution in the Israel-Palestine conflict is for one state called Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel with a hyphen in which every Jew, Muslim, Christian lives as an equal citizen under the law. One man, one woman, one vote. Just like we fought for in South Africa is what we should be fighting for in Israel, Palestine. If we can persuade the fair-minded listener that that's actually the only equitable way in which this crisis, this century-old conflict can be brought uh, uh, under control and brought uh, towards resolution, that's the only way to do it. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, George. Um, we have a question from Fran. Go ahead, Fran. You're right. Um, I just wondered what you thought about like the right wing, like Trump, sort of switching this media thing like on his head, and he like claims that fake news is written by the establishment against him. Do you get what I'm saying? They're like, yeah, yeah. I, I think he's done. Go on, you go. On. I think, no, I think he's done a really good job on that. I wish Corbyn had done that. I wish Corbyn had uh, had uh, treated the media that were destroying him in the way that Trump has treated the media that is seeking to destroy him, because uh, Trump is right. Uh, they are fake news. CNN exists only to uh, destroy uh, Donald Trump. Now, we're against both of them. We're against Trump and we're against Biden. We're not for Biden because he's not Trump. We're against both of them. And we think that if you follow the line of uh, uh, the lesser of two evils, all you're doing is guaranteeing that evil will continue to win. Uh, and that next time around, it will be an even worse choice uh, between the two uh, evils. So I'm, uh, I'm fully supporting and hope he will run. Uh, governor Jesse Ventura, former governor of Minnesota. I hope he runs. I hope he runs as the Green Party candidate. But if not, I hope he runs as an independent uh, third party candidate. Um, I'm against them all. But that's not going to put me on the side of CNN or MSNBC uh, because, I, because I hate Donald Trump. Uh, they are lie machines, absolute lie machines, even worse than we've got here. And their hypocrisy is, of course, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, by the support, which overwhelmingly the US media does, uh, the support of Joe Biden. Uh, with all the baggage uh, that he is carrying, increasingly, uh, falteringly. Thanks, George. And the next question comes from uh, Jamie McNeil. Go ahead, Jamie. Good evening, George. Uh, just a quick query, really. You may have answered this already as a little bit late to the meeting. Given the quite successful campaign by the group led by donkeys that use billboards, um, do you believe that could be a viable option to transmit the Workers' Party message um, across the next few years? Billboards? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in uh, billboards, but they are extremely expensive. Although what I do think would be good uh, if our uh, people at the center uh, could begin slowly to uh, develop uh, a, an inventory uh, of small business people that support us. And there are far more than you would uh, automatically expect. There are uh, supporters of ours that own uh, small corner shops uh, or, uh, or uh, small businesses uh, where they have the ability to make available to us uh, sites that we could use for billboards. 
Uh, of course, the, uh, the cost of commercial billboarding is, uh, is way beyond our uh, reach, uh, fantastically so. Uh, but I do think it is a very, uh, a very powerful uh, advertising medium. Um, as I drive into uh, the RT building on a Sunday, now that there's virtually no traffic around, I see just how extraordinary is the, uh, is the power of these billboards. Some of them very beautiful and very creative and artistic uh, also. Uh, so, you know, um, advertising works. <laughs> That's why they spend so much money on it. Thanks, George. And a question from Sammy McKenzie. Uh, what ways can we channel our party towards those disenfranchised with those who have left the Labour Party and other parties that are politically left-leaning and desire a new type of working class politics? Well, uh, of course, uh, most of the people now joining us are people who were in the Labour Party. There is a mass exodus out of the Labour Party. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a hemorrhage uh, rather than everyone leaving uh, at the same time. But uh, over the last uh, couple of months, uh, the Labour Party has been hemorrhaging members. And that will go on for the rest of this year as uh, Starmer, the full horror uh, of Starmer uh, becomes obvious. The brutal, brutal dispatching uh, of the Labour Party's general secretary, Jimmy Formby, Jenny's uh, undergoing chemotherapy. Uh, she's a, a cancer patient. Uh, but uh, Sir Keir uh, has nonetheless hounded her out of her job. Uh, the way in which the Labour Party is rigging the so-called investigation uh, into uh, the evidence which emerged, which horrified every Labour Party member with any decency, uh, is uh, obvious. They're, uh, they're going to blame uh, the departing general secretary, the cancer patient. They're going to blame her uh, for the uh, papers, the leaked labor uh, papers. And they're going to blame anyone who has left the premises. Uh, Seamus Milne, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, they'll all be uh, blamed uh, for, for this. Talk about shooting the messenger. Uh, so that will lead to a, a still bigger hemorrhage. Uh, some cling on uh, with increasingly less persuasive uh, arguments, like hang on to the NEC elections uh, in the uh, summer, like the NEC, which is already in the control of Keir Starmer, which was in any case in the control of the right, even when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader, because at least half of the so-called lefts on the NEC were actually on the right. Landsman was their leader, but he was by no means the uh, only one. There were many who were elected on left-wing tickets. So that's not going to happen. Keir Starmer and the Blairites who are now in charge of Labour are never ever going to relinquish that charge. There will be no more morons, to use their word, uh, nominating uh, just for a laugh, just for the sake of the debate, uh, a left-wing challenger for the Labour leader. As a matter of fact, the rules will be rigged uh, that the Parliamentary Labour Party through its control of the nomination process, will have absolute control over the election of a Labour leader. So any Labour leader who has the support of their MPs will continue as leader, just like before the democratization of the party in the early 80s. Uh, so the NEC elections will come and go. Nothing will change. Starmer will be just as bad uh, and uh, so that hemorrhage will continue. Uh, our appeal can't appeal to them all uh, because some of them are liberals. Some of them are Trotskyites. Some of them are both at the same time. 
two sides of the same coin. We, we can't appeal to them. We don't want to. We don't want to appeal to them. But for decent working class socialists in the Labour Party, of whom there were and are a very substantial number, a six-figure number, we say that we represent what a Labour Party, a working class Labour Party should be. And you should join us. Because staying in a party on the basis that you're going to fight your own party for the rest of your political life is the very definition of a waste of time. Trust me, I've been there and done it. It's bad for your soul. You've no idea how liberated I feel inside the Workers' Party. You could feel that way too. Fantastic. And last question of the night comes from John Larkin. Go ahead, John. George, can you hear me? I can, John. Oh, good. Uh, if we are going after the working class vote, as you said before, uh, what ways can we encourage them to become politically active again in the wider context of voter apathy, post Corbyn, etc., and the clear shortfalls of the mainstream media, which you've uh, obviously eloquently mentioned? Secondly, linked to this question, do we think initiatives such as the Workers' Party uh, Solidarity Fund can cut through the noise in the theatre to prove to working class voters that we are different and we will fight for them? Yes, uh, and you are uh, a living example uh, of uh, a bus driver who stood up for their members, who was victimised by the company as a result, uh, and... Therefore, we have gained credit from you. Our people who are trade unionists have to be the best trade unionists. Those that are shop stewards have to be the best shop stewards. Those that are students in the universities have to be the best students. Those that are uh, active on social media have to be the best on social media. Our CADA has to be impressive they have to be the change uh, that they want to build people have to be able to look at them and say well that lad's from the workers party that woman is from the workers party see how she deals with our neighbors see how he fights for the uh, his workmates and her workmates see how they've studied the subjects that we're dealing with as students and so on. That's the very essence of our work. It was once upon a time, because these words I'm using to you now were taught to me by Michael Magahi, the former miners leader in Scotland. They were taught to me by old communists. These were the rubrics of uh, the way in which the Communist Party in Britain in the 1940s and 50s uh, became big and powerful uh, because they approached politics like that. I'm afraid to say that's all long gone and they have virtually no influence anymore. Uh, but we are on the way up and uh, we are ready to learn uh, from other people. And, uh, and I feel sure that the fund that we've set up, thanks to you, we should really call it after you, uh, uh, we, we, we set this fund up so that uh, we'll have some small means uh, by which we can defend workers uh, under attack. And by the way, for the rest of this year and well into next year, uh, some of the biggest political issues in the country will be about defending workers who have been victimized for defending workers. It's happening already in Amazon. It's happened in your bus company. It will happen on the railways for sure. Happen in the postal service. That the people who stand up for the rights, for the safety, the lives of their workmates 
will be victimized uh, by the employer. And the unions will have to step up to the plate and uh, begin to do the job they're paid for. Uh, because you're not paid, uh, but you did a lot more for your workmates uh, than uh, official union structures, at least in the beginning, uh, were prepared to do. I said it before, I'll say it again. Some people don't like it. I'm amazed at how silent the unions are in this, uh, in this incredible, unprecedented period. Maybe they are saying things and I just don't hear it, in which case their communications are not very good. But if I was a trade union official, now, if I was the leader uh, of uh, uh, a powerful trade union, I, I'd actually be forcing my way into the Channel 4 News studio. I'd, I'd actually have already set up my own radio and TV channel. I'd be taking this fight now uh, into the public uh, arena. But actually, with the exception of the RMT and the CWU, I actually don't hear anything at all uh, from the unions. Just at a time when they had the possibility to make themselves incredibly relevant and increasingly relevant. I just haven't heard from them. The health service unions, for example. Where are the health? I see hundreds of people, hundreds, fighting for the rights of health service workers online at this time. But I never see the health service unions. I never hear from them unless they've effectively blocked me and so I can not hear the wonderful songs that they're singing. But I doubt that. Uh, so, uh, more power to your elbow, John. Uh, you're not called Larkin for nothing. The great James Larkin, the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, was the man who coined the phrase, it's better to die on your feet than to live forever on your knees. Thank you. Fantastic way to end the evening. And it's been great to see these meetings growing and growing in terms of the members engaging and the viewers online. Uh, so just a shout out to everyone watching on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. If you want to get involved, if you want to come and participate in these Workers' Party meetings, just go and sign up online, workerspartybritain.org. Come and sign up. Um, we've made it as accessible as possible for everyone to get involved. Come and have a say and help us build this thing and make a real difference in Britain. And don't forget to join us this uh, Saturday at 8 p.m. to commemorate the uh, great victory of the Soviet Union. And thanks again, George. Thank you.